title of this little thing that I want to share is, is Humbled by the Cross. Um, speaking about worship, and I, I thought I just want to quickly share two of my favorite scriptures around worship. I've got many favorite scriptures around worship, so I can't say these are my two favorites, but they're two of my favorites around worship. First one is from Colossians 3 verse 16. Many of you will know, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Such a beautiful scripture, just to go and meditate on this, that there's this element of corporate worship, you know, where we come together and we sing to one another, and there's thanksgiving that's in our hearts, but it's all within the context of the word of Christ dwelling in us richly. And I just want to... I'm so thankful for people like Rodé, who, you know, theologians in our midst who, who encourage us and urge us to get planted in the Word. Because if we don't know the Word of God, then we don't know how to worship, we don't know who we worship, and we don't know why we worship. Because if we don't know the Word and what the Word says about God, then we're actually just worshiping a God of our own making, and one that's been passed on by maybe tradition or second-hand knowledge, but I encourage you to get stuck into the Word. If we want to know how to worship, we need to know the Word. And this beautiful scripture, this instruction, let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. So I encourage you, those who haven't done Bible school, this is a good time to, to think about it. The next semester starts in June, July, July. My second favorite scripture that I'm just sharing briefly as an introduction is 1 Corinthians 10, 31. It says, so whether you eat or drink, Whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. And just the context of this chapter, Paul is speaking to the Corinthians, and he's, he's speaking about idolatry, basically. And he's speaking about uh, even specifically, more specifically food, and food that's been sacrificed to idols, and you know, should a Christian with a good conscience, should he eat that food or, or not? And there's this whole debate, this whole back and forth of what, what should we um, be allowed to do and what shouldn't we do? And then he ends, this is kind of this conclusion, which is just so powerful. Whether you eat or you drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. And I think that was like Tobias' testimony as well. I mean, without singing, he's glorifying God through his work and through his studies. There's just such a beautiful commentary just on this one verse from A.W. Tozer. I'm going to read it for you as he says it because I cannot come up with things like A.W. Tozer can. Paul's, ex- it's on the screen. <clears throat> Paul's exhortation to do all to the glory of God is more than pious idealism. So it's more than just a nice thought uh, in an idealistic way. It's an integral part of the sacred revelation and is to be accepted as the very word of truth. It's very true. <laughs> it opens before us the possibility of making every act of our lives contribute to the glory of God. Lest we should be too timid to include everything, Paul mentions specifically eating and drinking. This humble privilege we share with the beasts that perish. If these lowly animal acts can be so performed as to honor God, then it becomes difficult to conceive of one that cannot. It's amazing, huh? In other words, if we can glorify God literally by our eating and our drinking, which is just something that we do, it's something that even animals do, what can we do? What, is there anything that we can't do to the glory of God? And so that's why when I study, I study to His glory. When I work, I work to His glory. My, re- my relationships, my family is to His glory. When I'm doing exciting things, it's to His glory. When I'm doing mundane things, it's to His glory. When I'm doing unexpected things, it's to his glory. When I'm doing routine things, when I'm washing dishes, when I'm taking out the rubbish, when I'm changing nappies, which I love to do. No, I don't. Um, My wife is amazing. She does most of the nappies. Um, But whatever I do, I can do that literally to the glory of God. I find that so encouraging because God sees everything as an opportunity to worship him. All right, so that's just a bit of an introduction. Just wanted to share two of my favorite scriptures around worship. When we speak about worship, there's so many things we can speak about. There's so many different dimensions to it. Um, And I don't want to neglect that. I don't want to say that I'm going to focus on the be-all and end-all of worship. I'm going to focus on one aspect. Because, I mean, 
we could speak about the worth of God, which is actually probably one of the more important things to speak about because that's why we worship. We worship because He's worthy. You see those beautiful pictures in Revelations where the angels and the, the, the elders and the heavenly beings, this, this whole heavenly host, what are they saying? They're saying worthy. They're speaking about the worth of Christ, the value of Christ. Um, and because He is worthy, we worship Him. Uh, we could speak about our boldness to approach Him. That's a part of our worship. You know, in Hebrews 4, it says that we can approach the throne of grace with confidence. Not because of what we have done, but because of what He has done. We can speak about um, the fact that in Romans 12, it says that we can offer our bodies as living sacrifices because this is our spiritual worship. Offering our bodies as sacrifices. We can speak about the role of the Holy Spirit. You know that God has given, He's poured the Spirit into our hearts, the Spirit that cries out, Abba, Father. That's from Galatians 4. And then also 1 Corinthians 6 where it says that our, te- our bodies are literally temples of the Holy Spirit. And that's in fact the reason we can worship is because we we have the Holy Spirit inside of us. If it wasn't for the Holy Spirit, we wouldn't have the capacity, we wouldn't have the ability to worship because we wouldn't be able to see God. When the Spirit is inside of us, we can see God and we can worship God. We could, another, probably one of the most significant passages of, in in, in Scripture around worship is John 4. It's this long conversation that Jesus has with a woman at the well, a Samaritan woman. And just, the fact that worship is mentioned so many times in that, in that passage lets you know, just take note here. This is, this is important. If you want to know something about worship, read this. And I encourage you, go spend time in John 4, where Jesus says that God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. That's the type of worship that God is looking for. We could speak about the Levites, the way that they worship in the tabernacle. David with all of his his. His team was huge. I mean, we had about eight or nine musicians here. In those days, they had thousands of musicians ministering to the Lord. There was this constant worship happening in, in David's tabernacle. Um, and we could speak about the worship of specific people in Scripture. David, it, this, this also amazes me. As a songwriter, uh, I write songs, and I, I trust that they're going to be powerful still in you know, five years' time or ten years' time. He wrote songs thousands of years ago, and we still base so many of our current songs on his psalms. Obviously, they're inspired. <laughs> it does help when it's the Word of God, but it's so amazing just to know, to, to see the, the life of worship that people like David or Job, Job facing absolute tragedy in the way he worships God, or Abraham, who has to sacrifice his son. That's worship. Okay, so there's, there's so many different things that we could speak about this morning, but I want to focus just on one. So please don't think this is, this is it with worship. It's just this one aspect. Um, and it started this, at the beginning of this year. Normally at the beginning of the year, we share some vision with the worship team, and this is what I felt for us as a team. And I remember thinking, I really feel it for us as a church as well, so I'm very thankful for the privilege to be able to share it with, with the church. Um, and so... I'm just going to speak about this one thing, and then we, we're going to have a, a discussion. And the key that I want to just share around worship is humility. And the amazing thing is, as I said at the beginning of the year, I spoke, spoke to the team about humility. And just since then, in the few months that's happened since, since January, I think God's been speaking to a lot of us about humility. Um, many of our lives, God has been humbling us. <laughs> Um, and it's, it's a painful process to go through humbling, but it's such a beautiful, it, re, it produces such beautiful fruit. So we're going to just chat about humility. It started with a scripture. Many of us know somewhere in scripture that it says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. And we love that. We love to quote that and with good reason because it's, a, it's an amazing promise, isn't it? That if we draw near to God, He promises to draw near to us. But sometimes we don't read the context around where that scripture comes from. The context is in James chapter 4. James is a difficult book to read for those. My name's sake, he was was an interesting person. Um, But let's just read 
this little section, James 4, verse 6 to 10, end of verse 6. So he's quoting elsewhere in Scripture where it says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. It's quite easy to read that and to not think it's so strong, but actually I read that in the original language there, God opposes the proud. That word oppose, the picture there is, is literally of, of like an, a commander of an army setting himself up in battle against another army. That's quite strong language. God doesn't just resist. He doesn't just not like. He opposes in that sense. He sets himself up in battle against the proud. But, and this is the good news, he gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. And then there's a bit of a challenging part. As I say, James is a difficult book to read. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. It's a powerful passage. Speaking of humility, and this is what we're going to discuss this morning. I'm going to ask you to break into groups of no more than four people, um, preferably three or four people uh, rather than two. So I'm going to give you 30 seconds just to do that, just to find somebody. Can you just make sure that there's nobody around you who's sitting on their own? So invite somebody to join you, three or four. All right, so we're going to have three discussions. I'm going to give you only, say, two or three minutes for each one. So don't write a thesis. Um, we're, just having a, we're just having an open discussion, and try and stay away from the, the right answer. Just, let's just share with one another. Let's just be, be honest with one another. And the first one, two questions. What is true humility? And then, what is humility not? Or in other words, what is false humility? I think it's important if we want to know what is true humility, we must also know what, what humility isn't. I think when we're speaking about humility, it's... It's obvious that it's, it's a condition of our hearts, but it's reflected in our actions as well. That it's not just something that stays in here and doesn't reflect in my behavior towards, towards others or towards God. Um, and there's a specific reason I asked what is false humility, because I think it's important for us to recognize it and to know it, because humility doesn't mean I have this attitude of, I'm a worm, or I'm worthless, because... That's, that's not the nature of humility. It's thinking about ourselves soberly. Um, and two scriptures that I want to just leave with you that you can, you can go and read up on is uh, towards the beginning of Romans 12. It speaks about not thinking of ourselves more highly than we ought, but soberly, because God has given each one a measure of grace. And that's the section where, where, where he goes on to speak about uh, the different gifts in the body and how God's given each one different gifts uh, so that no one may boast, and we, we're not supposed to be in competition of one another. It's powerful scripture. Also, at the be- beginning of Philippians 2, say, it speaks about, and this is also probably one of the most clear description of, descriptions of humility. In lowliness of mind, esteem others higher than yourselves. Um, and consider not only your own interests, but also the interests of others. It's powerful. Okay, so... We're going to continue to the next two questions, and if somebody didn't get a, a chance to, to speak in this first round, then maybe be humble and, and let them speak in the next round. <laughs> so how do you know if you're humble, and do you think you're humble? <laughs> the second question is optional. <laughs> let's, let's have a show of hands. Who's, who's humble? <laughs> when it, some of you, you know, normally you have to nominate somebody to be, to be humble. One of the more interesting scriptures is in Numbers. It says that, and Moses was the most humble man on the earth. And Moses wrote Numbers. So... There's no false humility there. No, there's a chance that a commentator added that 
later, but I think it would be really funny if Moses wrote that about himself, that, and Moses was the most humble man on earth. My, my wife gave a really good answer for this one because I, I asked her these questions before the time. She says, and how do, you, how do you know if you're humble? She said, if I don't get offended. And, yeah. And so then when I asked, so do you think you're humble? She said, no, because she still gets offended. And I think that's probably true for, for all of us. Just, I won't, I won't dwell on this, but I encourage you to ask God about your, your have this conversation with him. Am I humble? Do, are there areas of pride in my life? Because I think we might be humble in some areas, but in, in other areas we, we do have pride. Uh, and really our hearts deceive us. <laughs> so it doesn't really help to ask ourselves. So ask God. When we ask like a, a really close accountability partner that you won't get offended with for too long, do you think that I'm humble? Okay, we've got one more discussion and we're going to end off with with this one, um, which I think is the most powerful. Two questions. How do we humble ourselves and how do we remain humble? Speaking about how, we, how do we humble ourselves and how do we remain in that place of humility before God? There's, there's so many things that can be said and I actually would have loved to hear what came out. Um, but I just felt this morning to share one thought with us. To humble ourselves is to consider what Christ did on the cross. To consider what He did often, to consider what He did constantly, to stay in that place of awe for what Jesus has done for us on the cross. Because we forget, and because we become familiar, we know the story, we sing the songs, and we become casual with the most priceless gift, with the most costly sacrifice. So I urge you and I encourage you to meditate often on what he's done. It will humble you. <laughs> it humbles us to consider what he's done. And we're actually going to do that now. We're going to spend a, a, some time in worship. Um, but often we, we don't, we can't just come up with these feelings ourselves. And so I encourage you to, to read scripture. And I'm going to just read two final scriptures just for us to meditate on, to consider what it is that he did for us. First one is taken from Isaiah 53, this beautiful prophecy of Christ. You can go and read the whole chapter and the, the bit before it and the bit afterwards as well. But from verse 4 to 6, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The Lord has laid on Christ the iniquity of us all. Later in the chapter, says that it pleased the Lord to bruise him. And this is something I've been wrestling through. It's just the reality of the wrath of God. The fact that my sin demands a penalty because of God's holiness and because of his perfection, because of his justice, there needs to be a penalty for my sin. But instead of it being released on me, it was released on Christ. He had to stand and just receive the wrath of God that was meant for me. And I don't think we can understand the love of God if we don't understand His holiness and His wrath. Because otherwise love is just a sentimental thing of, yes, God loves me, but we don't understand the context of 
what it took for him to love us. And then the final scripture that I want us to read together, Philippians 2 verse 5 to 11. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it a robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a servant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. And then this awesome, therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Does that humble you? To read these words of what Christ has done and to see the humility of Christ, that God would humble himself not only to come to earth, that God in some miraculous way would reduce himself to the form of a man on earth, that he would die, and not just any death, the most shameful death. And I encourage you to make this a part of your, when you worship on your own personally and when you worship, when we come together corporately together like this, to make this a part of, of our worship, to consider what he has done, to meditate on what he has done, to thank him for the cross, to humble ourselves. Sometimes that means going on our knees. There's something significant about just bowing before God. It's, it's, it's a physical demonstration of what is going on in our hearts, that, Lord, I make myself low before you. Let's make it a part of our worship. Let's make it part of our response, our expression of worship to kneel before God, but not only with our bodies, but also with our hearts and with our minds, to acknowledge what He's done, to meditate on, this, on what He's done, and to think of what He's done, and to then to respond with thanksgiving. Um, this morning, <clears throat> I felt God reminding of me of the scripture in Isaiah 64 where it says that our righteous deeds are like filthy rags before Him. And I've never read the, the next part, which says that they're like autumn leaves that are dry and withered. And then when the band was praying together, two words came up that just this picture of dryness, of a, a dead tree with dead leaves. And then another picture as well of these, de- and, but then the sun rose over, over, these, over this dead um, tree. And then another picture of children dancing over dead leaves. And I think that's just so powerful, especially with what Danae was, who, who brought the word, um, where our, our best, our most, our righteous deeds, they're like filthy rags, they're like dead autumn leaves. We cannot boast in ourselves, we cannot boast in what we've done, but we can boast in what He has done. Put the emphasis on what He has done. Remember, consider, meditate on what He has done. And because of what He has done, we can dance. It's not because of our rags. It's not because of our dead leaves, in a sense. But it's because of what, of what he has done. So, Carla and Estelle, you can come up. We're just going to respond in a time of worship.